This free presentation is brought to you by Quantum University. Hello, I'm Rupert Sheldrake. I'm speaking to you from London. I'm a biologist. Um, I've spent much of my career working on morphogenetic fields, um, memory and nature, um, unexplained powers of the mind and consciousness studies. All of these are relevant to healing and medicine, but I'm not myself a practitioner of medicine. Um, and I'm talking today about morphogenetic fields. Morphogenetic fields are fields that shape form in living organisms. Um, the very word morphogenesis comes from the Greek words morphe meaning form and genesis meaning coming into being. Morphogenetic fields are regions of activity that shape developing organisms. They're one kind of a larger category called morphic fields. It's as if morphic fields is the genus and morphogenetic fields are one species of morphic field. Other species of morphic field include uh, behavioral fields which underlie instinctive uh, and learned behavior in animals and humans. Um, social fields which underlie the organization of social groups like flocks of birds or hives of bees or human families or football teams and um, mental fields which underlie mental activity. All of these are different kinds of morpho uh, morphic field. But I'm going to be talking primarily about morphogenetic fields because those are the fields that shape form, that underlie healing and regeneration in organisms, and the ones most relevant to medicine. But I hope also to talk about uh, social fields and mental fields and the nature of memory. I started my research career as a biologist working in developmental biology. And one of the great problems in developmental biology is to understand how form appears. How is it that a fertilized egg with relatively little structure gives rise to a complex organism like you or me, um, containing many different uh, organs, many kinds of cells, and so on? This is still not understood. Uh, attempts to say, well, it must be genetically programmed, um, don't really tell us very much. All they say is that something's organizing it and we don't yet know what it is. But within the realm of biology, um, the concept of morphogenetic fields as a possible explanation for form, as indeed one of the primary explanations for form, has been uh, current since the 1920s. I didn't make this term up myself. It's widely used within biology. Uh, and the reason it was introduced is that uh, to explain how form comes into being, you have to have a cause of form. Um, and as an organism develops, as more structures appear, as it undergoes embryology and development, um, there's more form comes from less. And like you are, and I come from a fertilized egg with very much less form than we have. How can you explain more form coming from less? Well, genes don't really explain it. What genes do is now well known. They code for the sequence of amino acids in proteins. They enable you to make the right proteins. And some genes are con concerned with the control of protein synthesis. But that doesn't really explain an organism. An organism is so much more than a collection of proteins. And think about your arms and your legs. Your arms and your legs have exactly the same genes. They have exactly the same proteins, the same myoglobin, hemoglobin, um, actomyosin, and so forth, the same membrane proteins. They're chemically identical, the same kind of bone, and yet they have different shapes. How come? They're different in shape if they've got the same genes, the same chemical constituents. Well, the answer is something else beyond, besides the genes and the chemicals must be giving them their shape. One analogy is provided by uh, buildings. If you think about buildings, look around you, you see buildings everywhere. Um, they're made of building materials like timber and cement and um, bricks and so on. And 
The same building materials can be used to build houses or buildings of different shapes. What makes the house or building a particular shape is not so much the building materials, uh, but the architect's plan. Without that plan, uh, there would be no building with a particular shape. Morphogenetic fields play the role of architectural plans. They're like invisible formative influences that shape organisms as they develop. When this term was first put forward, the primary analogy was with magnetic fields. And on the first slide, we see a magnetic field. You're all familiar with magnetic fields. Perhaps too familiar. We forget how wonderful they are, how amazing they are. The magnetic field is within the magnet, but it also extends invisibly around it. When you sprinkle iron filings around the magnet, as has been done here, uh, you see the lines of force, the pattern of the field. But it has that pattern, even if there are no iron filings, it's invisible. Um, and uh, it's within and around uh, the magnet. In the 1920s, when the idea of morphogenetic fields was first put forward, this was the primary metaphor. The morphogenetic field is within the organism, it's also around the organism, and it's invisible. It has a shape or a form, and it's that field which helps shape or form the developing organism. Fields are inherently holistic. You can't have a slice of the magnetic field. You can't just cut a bit out of it. And if you cut the magnet you see in half, you don't get one half with the North Pole and one half with the South Pole. You get two complete magnets, each with a North and a South Pole. This is a very important property because organisms are inherently holistic and their abilities to regenerate um, are a little bit like the ability of a magnet uh, to remain a whole magnet even if you cut it into pieces. This is very different from any machinery we know. If you cut a computer into pieces, all you get is a broken computer. If you cut a car into pieces, you just get a broken car. If you cut a field organized system like a magnet or a hologram, which is an interference pattern within a field uh, into pieces, uh, you can constitute the whole from uh, those pieces. Uh, fields are not divisible. Um, they are holistic. Well, the idea is that morphogenetic fields shape uh, developing organisms and they shape not just multicellular organisms, they shape unicellular organisms as well. These organisms can have quite complex patterns um, and forms, even though they're only a single cell. If we look at the next slide, we'll see uh, radiolarians. These are single-celled organisms that live in the sea. And they have a silicaceous skeleton. What you're seeing is the skeletons of these cells. These are all different species. As you see, they're completely different in form. And these are all formed by a single cell which has one nucleus and one lot of proteins. You can't possibly explain these, these forms by turning on or off protein synthesis because um, it's all in the same cell. The next slide shows um, radiolarians in a famous 19th century illustration by Ernst Haeckel. And these uh, radiolarians, uh, again, like the ones you've just seen photographs of, have these very complex skeletons which are all formed by the single cell. The next slide shows pollen grains. Uh, these are from different species. Each species has its own characteristic kind of pollen grain, which is why you can reconstruct what grew where in the past by looking at pollen grains preserved in bogs. Um, you can identify the species. Each of these are single cells as well, with quite distinctive forms. And finally, the next slide shows a single-celled alga, which grows in fresh water, called Acetabularia, or the mermaid's nightcap. Um, these are gigantic single cells the stalks are about two inches long. So we're talking about gigantic single-celled organisms. They have one nucleus, it's in the little root region, the rhizoid, uh, and they form this complex cap. All of this is done on the basis of a single cell making proteins from the nucleus. But there's no way the nucleus and the cap can act as a kind of brain shaping that 
cap and the genes in it aren't a program shaping it. Something else is shaping it, and that is, on this hypothesis, the morphogenetic field. There's a field that shapes that cap in that particular way. Now, the, the um, morphogenetic fields in higher organisms are organized in a hierarchic way, and the next slide illustrates this. This is the basic pattern in which any hierarchically organized holistic system exists. All of nature is made up of nested hierarchies. The little circles, for example, could be subatomic particles, and the next big uh, so the circles that contain those could be atoms, and the next circles up could be molecules, the next circles up could be crystals, crystals of those molecules. At each level, there's an organizational form uh, which contains parts which are themselves forms at a lower level. Each of these levels is organized by a morphogenetic field. Crystals, too, have morphogenetic fields. These could also be small circles, could be organelles inside cells, inside tissues, inside organs. Uh, so in living organisms, there's a hierarchy of levels of morphogenetic field. And the next slide showing a bat embryo um, enables you to see, of course, the different organs within it, the eyes and the, the limbs and so forth. Um, all of these have their own level of morphogenetic field, and those contain tissues, those contain cells. Morphogenetic fields um, at all these levels shape what happens, and they act as kind of modules of development. Development is essentially modular, and each module has its own field. You can see this in the next slide, which shows um, a pea leaf. A normal pea leaf, like this one, has at the base of the leaf pairs of leaflets, things that look like leaflet, uh, leaf, little leaves. And then uh, further up, the leaflets have been transformed into tendrils. We have tendrils which wrap around things and help support the plant. And the bits on the side of the leaf stem can develop either into leaflets or into tendrils. It's a bit like flipping a switch on a tuning circuit of a TV set. You can switch from one channel to another. Each channel has its own form and structure. Um, uh, and you get one or the other. You don't get bits in between. You get either a leaflet or a tendril. The next slide shows a mutant pea leaf um, in which all the side buds have turned into leaflets. There are no tendrils, just a whole lot of leaflets. And the next one shows another mutant where the side buds on the leaf stem uh, have turned into tendrils. So this again is a pea leaf, um, and you barely recognize it as such, but now it's only producing tendrils instead of leaflets. So what I'm today suggesting is that the morphogenetic field of the leaflet or the tendril is like a module of development. It shapes development. In this case, they've all been switched into tendril development. The previous one, they were all switched into leaflet development. Um, and uh, so the field is shaping what happens. One of the things about morphogenetic fields that is very striking and is one of the reasons that the whole concept was put forward in the first place is that they help to explain regeneration. If development occurred in the clunky way that most biologists still think it does by switching on genes and gradients of proteins that cause another gene to be switched off, all you'd have is collections of proteins made in the right cells at the right time, but they, they don't explain how form is generated and they don't explain regeneration. If an organism is damaged, it can regenerate uh, the missing bits um, in a way that would be very hard to understand from the uh, standard view of genetic programs. You could conceivably rerun a program and develop an, an organism again, but in regeneration, it develops part of the organism in a way that's different from the way it would normally develop. The next slide shows uh, what happens if you take a dragonfly egg and tie it in the middle and kill one half of it? On the left, you see a normal dragonfly embryo inside the egg. 
On the right, you see an egg which was tied off in the middle. The top half was killed. And the lower part of the egg, which would normally form the lower part of the dragonfly embryo, um, has now formed not half a dragonfly, not just the back part, but a small but complete dragonfly embryo. Now, this is very analogous to cutting a magnet in half and having each half be a complete magnet with a complete magnetic field. And that's exactly uh, what's happening here uh, as far as uh, the morphogenetic field hypothesis is concerned. Let's look at the next slide. Um, and here you see Acetabularia, the mermaid's uh, nightcap that I showed you earlier, diagrammatically represented. And what happens here is that a part of the stem has been cut out. And that part of the stem regenerates a new mermaid's nightcap without a nucleus. The nucleus has been left behind in the rhizoid at the base. And even in the absence of a nucleus, it can uh, regenerate the whole organism. This proves that the whole process is not being controlled by the genes or by the nucleus. It's under the control of the morphogenetic field. These organisms survive a few weeks and then they die. They do need to be able to go on making proteins to replace proteins that have broken down. And for that, they need the nucleus. So they can't live forever without it, but they can certainly regenerate without it. The next slide shows uh, regeneration in the flatworm, planaria. Um, you can cut up these flatworms into little bits and each little bit, the top, the bottom, the middle, the right, the left, can regenerate a complete flatworm um, from the bits that are there. It's even more surprising than that. Recent experiments done by Michael Levine in Tufts University um, have shown that you can train flatworms to respond to light in a particular way. They learn something. And you can then chop off their heads, which contain most of their nervous organization. It's not really a brain, um, but it's a kind of ganglion in, in the head region. Um, but it's the closest, they've, nearest they've got to a brain. You cut off their head, decapitate them. Um, they grow a new head. And what's more, when they've grown the new head, they can remember uh, what they learned before. This is a very remarkable result. Again, it's something that um, I'll come back to soon, uh, the question of memory, uh, which this hypothesis helps, to uh, helps us to understand. The next slide shows the regeneration of limbs in an amphibian uh, uh, salamander or a newt. And you can see here that the um, leg on the left, uh, the leg was cut off in the forelimb um, and in, 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 I mean, the fore part of the arm and in the, on the right, it was cut off uh, closer down the, the first joint, the first part of the arm. And in both cases, the stump regenerates a complete leg. This is a very remarkable example of regeneration. Interestingly, this happens in newts, uh, but it doesn't happen in frogs, which are like uh, similarly amphibious uh, members of the amphibia. It doesn't happen in us, of course. Um, uh, and in general, higher animals have lower regenerative capacities than lower ones. But it's interesting that in the amphibia, uh, it happens with newts. I think that the morphogenetic field for the missing limb is still there, even in a frog, even though something seems to block the regenerative process. Um, I think even humans, when an arm or a leg is cut off, still have the field of the missing limb. And indeed, I think that's what phantom limbs are. I think they're the fields of the missing limb, which the person experiences as if it's still there. They're feeling the field of the limb without the limb itself. It feels completely real uh, to most people who've had amputations, uh, even though it's not materially present. That provides one way of actually investigating morphogenetic fields. And I won't have time today to talk about research on phantom limbs, but if you're interested, there are some simple experiments that can be done that would, I think, be very enlightening. I've already done some preliminary ones with successful results. Uh, those are described in my book, um, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. The next slide shows one of the most remarkable 
examples of regeneration. In this case, uh, scientists removed the lens from the eye of a newt. They deliberately chose a form of injury that would probably not happen in nature. Um, uh, surgical removal of just a lens is hardly likely to occur to a newt going about its normal business. Um, and what happens here is that the lens is regenerated by um, formation of a new lens from the margin of the iris. During normal embryology, the um, lens is formed by folding in of skin from the outside. It doesn't form from the iris. So the eye has found a new way of making a lens. Um, and this would, wouldn't make sense if, if everything was just sort of pre-programmed according to some kind of mechanistic mechanisms. Um, but if there's a field that shows, gives the eye the form of the whole uh, eye, um, it can help re, um, guide this regenerative process so it gets another lens. These uh, findings are obviously highly relevant to medicine because a great deal of healing depends on regeneration and on the self-healing capacities of bodies. Healing was going on long before the invention of medicine. It, it, all animals and plants have healing capacities on which they totally depend. And so did our human ancestors uh, before, even before shamans and herbalists and later doctors and surgeons came along. The ability to heal is inherent to all forms of life. And these morphogenetic fields underlie that healing process. Of course, medicine uh, can help them do it. And I think most forms of healing, uh, conventional and alternative, rely on the body's own healing capacities. Um, they accentuate or encourage or catalyze or empower the healing capacities that are already there. Um, even the most sophisticated modern surgery relies on the body's healing capacities to make good uh, after the surgery has happened. And also on the body's ability to adjust the nervous activity, to adjust to the new circumstances uh, of the body after, say, an amputation or some uh, um, joint replacement or whatever. Now, how do morphogenetic fields work? This is where we get into the realm of the unknown. Most of my colleagues in the realm of biology accept the morphogenetic field concept. It's very useful. We need something like this. But they think of them as working in a purely mechanistic manner uh, through genes, proteins, and molecular biology, but without knowing how. What they usually say is um, their mechanism of action is not yet fully understood, um, uh, but given further advances in molecular biology, cell biology, and so forth, and computer modeling, uh, we will be able to understand these in the future. This is really a form of promissory materialism, uh, issuing promissory notes against explanations that um, don't yet exist. Um, I myself think that they work in a way rather different from the accepted principles of physics and chemistry. I think science uh, has not achieved the total goal of understanding nature uh, I don't think it's even achieved uh, a total description of all the forces and fields in nature, which many of my colleagues assume it has. I think there are uh, principles at work which we don't yet have in standard science. And I think morphogenetic fields work according to new principles. I think how they work primarily is through um, imposing patterns on otherwise indeterminate or probabilistic processes. We know that at the quantum level, things happen in a probabilistic way. We know that um, in macroscopic systems like the weather, there's chaos and complexity theories telling us that um, uh, even the tiniest perturbation can change the way things happen. In biological systems, everything is quivering on the edge of chaos or the edge of randomness, the firing of the nerve impulse could go one way or the other. There's kind of random fluctuations throughout the whole nervous system. The activities of membrane transport proteins 
uh, could go one way or another. Everything's probabilistic. All sorts of things could happen, and left to their own devices, they'd happen at random. But with a morphogenetic field imposing a form or pattern on them, restricting the probabilistic processes, a pattern can be imposed. I think morphogenetic fields work by imposing such patterns. I go into more detail uh, about this in my book, Morphic Resonance, um, in Britain called A New Science of Life, the original title. This is the third edition. Uh, or in my book, The Presence of the Past, which is the fullest description of this hypothesis. They also work by guiding processes of development along canalized pathways of change to which the British biologist C.H. Waddington gave the name creode. The next slide shows his diagram of a creode. He imagined a ball rolling down a series of valleys and the ball could represent the fertilized egg and then um, as it divides, uh, new balls, as it were, go down different pathways towards different valleys, which represent the structures of different organs within the body. As the ball rolls down, representing the developmental process, if it's disturbed, if there's any stress to the system, any chemical strain or high temperature or physical jolt, uh, the ball may move up the side of one of the valleys. It may depart from its normal pathway of movement, but it will then roll down again and resume uh, its development towards the same end or goal. Development is attracted towards ends or goals, which are called attractors in mathematical models of morphogenetic fields. And this is a simple way of visualizing attractors and the way that development is normally canalized towards these attractors following a standard pathway of change. But it also shows how, with disturbances, the development can happen in an unusual, a different way, but still reach the same goal. The next slide shows um, a basic principle of morphogenetic fields and morphic fields in general. They are probabilistic. Um, I'm going to explain in a little while why I think they depend on a kind of memory given by the process I call morphic resonance. But for the time being, um, I just want you to look at these composite photographs. The one on the left was an average of 30 different female scientists, and the one on the right of 45 male scientists working at the John Innes Institute in Norwich, England. Um, these are average faces and uh, made by superimposing all those different photographs, they bring out the common features. Any peculiar individual features tend to get diluted out, so you get a kind of reinforcement of the common feature of uh, features of the face. And if you could see morphogenetic fields, I think they'd look like this. They'd be a kind of probability structure, a bit like quantum fields, uh, rather blurred in the outlines, depending on probability. Um, so it's a probable form, working probabilistically on probabilistic events. Morphogenetic fields are vibratory patterns of activity. All organisms are in rhythmic patterns of vibration. In fact, everything in nature is. An electron is a vibration in an electron field. A photon is a vibration in the electromagnetic field. Um, Proteins are in constant vibration. Um, uh, everything about bodies is rhythmic. We have a heart that beats rhythmically. We breathe rhythmically. We have brain waves like alpha waves that happen rhythmic, rhythmically. And um, there are many rhythms within cells. And then, of course, we have daily rhythms like sleeping and waking, circadian rhythms, which are inherent to many organisms. Uh, we have annual rhythms with the seasons. Women have monthly rhythms with their periods. So uh, everything about life is rhythmic. And the rhythmic processes, uh, just by themselves, have an ability to create form. Um, I've recently got very interested in research using cymoscopes, C-Y-M-A, cymoscopes, which are ways in which small volumes of fluid, usually water, can be vibrated at particular frequencies. When you do this, it sets up a particular pattern of vibration 
on, of waves on the surface of the fluid. And these can be visualized by shining light and using particular optical techniques that reveal in great detail uh, these wave patterns. And something as simple as vibrating a small volume of fluid in a circular container, this is less than one milliliter of fluid, uh, can set up amazing patterns which are rather like complex biological forms, like flowers, for example. Let's take a look at a couple of recent cymoscope images uh, showing water vibrating at different frequencies. Now here you see the pits being vibrated. The, it takes a while for the pattern to appear, and there it appears. And here's this amazing oscillating pattern just created by vibrating water at that frequency. Now here we have it at a different frequency, and it's a different pattern. Let's see that once again, because it's truly remarkable what forms can emerge through vibratory patterns. And again, we'll see the higher frequency. Good. So this um, ability to create form through vibration is something which hasn't really been paid much attention to within biology and I think is a crucial uh, feature of how uh, morphogenetic fields work. You can vibrate fluids that are not just round but in different shapes and you get patterns of stripes and patterns appearing uh, that look very like uh, biological forms. And of course these are two-dimensional surfaces but when you're looking at three-dimensional vibratory patterns uh, which is what I think you have in living organisms, then, of course, even more complex forms can appear. Now, morphogenetic fields must be inherited. Um, uh, foxglove plants give rise to foxgloves. Hedgehogs give rise to hedgehogs. Skunks give rise to skunks. Giraffes give rise to giraffes. The forms of these organisms are inherited and I've been arguing that I don't think this happens through the genes. The genes are just about protein synthesis and turning on and off protein synthesis. The forms have to be inherited some other way. Now, this is my own particular take on morphogenetic fields, and the hypothesis is that they're inherited by the process I call morphic resonance, a resonance across space and time based on similarity. For example, the patterns you've just seen on the cymoscope are resonant patterns, and um, there could be a resonance across time involving patterns of that kind. The patterns within a developing foxglove or a developing giraffe should resonate across time so that a present-day giraffe growing as an embryo in the womb of its mother um, is resonating with previous giraffes, which have been developing in the wombs of their mothers and growing into adult giraffes. And this resonance um, carries the form of the field of the giraffe, the morphogenetic field. It carries it as a kind of average or composite of many previous giraffes, millions of them, a bit like the composite faces we saw. So I think morphic resonance is a fundamental principle of memory in nature. I'm not supposing that this is just something confined to biology. Um, I think it's part of the way nature works. I think the way crystals crystallize depends on morphic resonance as well. The first time you make a new chemical compound into a crystal, it won't have a pre-existing morphogenetic field. But if you make it again, um, the second time it should happen faster than the first time because there'll be an influence from the first crystals by morphic resonance. The third time it should happen easier still from, by influences from the first and the second crystals, the fourth time from the first, second, and third, etc. There'll be a build-up uh, through morphic resonance of memory, making it crystallize quicker and quicker. And newly synthesized compounds are indeed very often hard to crystallize to start with. People wait weeks or months uh, before they crystallize, and then they crystallize easier and easier as time goes on. In, in most general terms, uh, this hypothesis suggests that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. The usual assumption within the sciences is that um, 
the laws of nature were all fixed at the very moment of the Big Bang, and they've been the same ever since. This is, a, I think, a very unjustified assumption. Um, in an evolutionary universe, it makes much more sense to think of the laws of nature as themselves evolving. And I think that's what's indeed happening. I discuss this in detail in, in the, the presence of the past, and also in uh, my most recent book, Science Set Free, which is called The Science Delusion in the, British, uh, in the British Version. This hypothesis provides all sorts of opportunities for empirical tests. One is with crystals, as I just mentioned, but there's another test with crystals, which are now very briefly discuss. If crystals become more stable, as the habit of forming that crystal becomes stronger, then it should be harder to break them up. They should not only form more easily, uh, they should be harder to break up. Now, the way you break up crystals is by heating them, and you reach a particular temperature at which the structure dissolves, it's lost. That's, of course, called the melting point. I'm predicting that newly synthesized compounds should show rises in their melting point. But compounds that have been around for millions of years, crystallizing in nature, will have so much morphic resonance from the past, they'll behave as if they're governed by fixed laws. They won't show these memory effects that new ones do have, because there'll be such a vast backlog of morphic resonance from the past. So I've done some research on the history of melting points, and I've compared melting points of substances that occur in nature uh, with synthetic related compounds that were first made by chemists in the 19th or the 20th century. The next slide shows some of these examples. On the left, we have compounds that occur in nature. On the left, at the top, salicin occurs in willow bark, crystallizes in nature. No change over the 20th century. These are the three dates of the 20th century. On the right is aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, a synthetic compound first made in the 19th century in Germany. And over the 20th century, the melting point has gone up quite considerably. We're talking here increases of 7, 8, 9, some, in some cases 15, 20 degrees centigrade. We're not talking fractions of a degree. Then uh, we have uh, penicillic acid, which occurs in nature in exudates from molds. And on the right, penicillamine, used as a chelating agent, uh, or it's also a breakdown product of penicillin, which is a synthetic form of um, what occurs in nature. There again, that has shown an increase in melting points, but the natural form hasn't. At the bottom, we see on the left, cocaine, which occurs in coca leaves and has been crystallizing in dried leaves for uh, millions of years no change in the 20th century. On the right, we see cocaine hydrochloride, uh, which uh, is the cocaine of commerce made by extracting coca leaves with hydrochloric acid. It doesn't occur in nature, and the melting point of that has gone up by about nine degrees um, over the course of the 20th century. It's possible to test for morphic resonance in the realm of developmental biology as well. And I'll just give one example. Uh, the next slide, shows at the top a normal fruit fly, Drosophila. And the normal fruit fly has two wings, like all flies. And in the segment below the wings, it has what are called halters, balancing organs. The lower example shows a mutant fruit fly where the halters have been transformed into wings. Um, so it's got four wings instead of two. This is very like the example I gave earlier of pea leaves, where uh, the same bud, as it were, could turn into a leaflet or a tendril. And there are some mutants where what, what are normally tendrils turn into leaflets, and then some where what are normally leaflets turn into tendrils. It's that kind of mutant. The technical name for these mutants is homeotic mutants. Well, it's as if the gene affects the tuning of the system and throws a switch so it tunes into a different morphogenetic field. Um, well, it turns out that with fruit flies, you can produce the same effect as a homeotic mutant just by changing the environment. Uh, no change in the genes. If you expose the eggs of fruit flies to ether, diethyl ether, um, 
three hours after they're laid. A few of the resulting flies have four wings instead of two, usually only about 2%. If you expose their eggs to ether, uh, then a higher proportion uh, have four wings instead of two. And if you keep doing this generation after generation, the proportion of four-winged flies goes up. The next slide shows an experiment of this kind. At the bottom axis is the number of generations that they've been treated, the eggs have been treated with ether for. And the vertical axis shows the percentage of four-winged flies in the population. The dotted lines going down to the right are where they stopped treating the eggs with ether and uh, the proportion of four-winged flies fell off. It didn't plummet down to zero straight away though. It carried on uh, for quite a few generations at a decreasing rate. Um, now this could be an epigenetic inheritance effect. Um, epigenetics is a form of inheritance of acquired characters which was until, recent, until recently highly taboo within biology but is now intensely fashionable. Um, but I think something more interesting is going on here. I think it's a morphic resonance effect uh, as well as an epigenetic effect. And the key experiment here is that the experimenters took some fruit flies whose ancestors had never been exposed to ether and after they'd done the first experiment they did a second experiment. Now if you look at the left at uh, the first time round, the first um, generation uh, treated with ether had about 2% uh, of the four-winged flies, the second generation about 6%. Uh, but the second time round, you'll see the line above that with the filled-in points, the first generation had 10% and the second generation 20% of these four-winged flies. I think that's because morphic resonance from the first lot of flies had made it easier for this abnormal pattern uh, to appear again. I should emphasize again, this is nothing to do with changes in the genes. It's to do with a developmental disturbance, more like the effects of thalidomide on human embryos, causing developmental abnormality because of the conditions in which the embryo grows. Um, now, if four-winged flies had a great evolutionary advantage, uh, then morphic resonance would make them appear more frequently, give them, a, a, and a, it could accelerate the whole evolutionary process. In fact, they don't have an advantage, so this effect's only seen in highly artificial experiments. Morphic resonance applies not only to development of chemicals and crystals, to the development of animals and plants, it also applies to behavior. If animals learn a new trick, say rats, then the more rats that learn it, the easier it should get for other rats to learn the same trick uh, subsequently. Does this actually happen? Well, it does seem to. Uh, in the 1920s, some classic experiments on rats done at Harvard showed that if you train them to escape from a water maze, um, rats, subsequent rats, their children, uh, escape quicker than their parents. They make fewer errors. The next slide shows uh, the results of one of these experiments at Harvard, which went on for 22 generations. The first rats were making more than an average of more than about 230 errors before they learned always to go to the correct exit. If they went to the wrong one, they got an electric shock. Their children learned quicker, they made fewer errors, and so on, uh, and until they got down to about 25 errors, about 10 times quicker. This was so surprising and unexpected that um, this work was repeated in Melbourne, Australia and in Edinburgh, Scotland. Their rats started off um, more or less where the uh, Harvard rats had left off, uh, at about 25 or 30 errors. Um, the most interesting data from, from Melbourne, um, as time went on, they got quicker and quicker at learning how to escape from the maze. In fact, soon some rats were doing it straight away without even a single error. Uh, they just inherited this knowledge. Um, now, was this what we now call epigenetic inheritance, some modification of the sperm or the eggs or the cytoplasm of the egg cell, or was it a morphic resonance effect? Well, the way to find out is to do a control experiment where you test rats whose parents had never been exposed to um, the, this particular task. And that's what they did in Australia. And what they found was that all rats of that breed 
were getting better, not just ones who had trained parents. Now, that's just what you'd expect with morphic resonance. I think something very similar happens with humans. It should be getting easier for humans to learn computer programming, to learn uh, skydiving, to learn snowboarding, or any of the new skills that are coming up in the modern world, both intellectual and manual skills, and also the physical skills that have been arising through this tremendous burst of creativity over the last hundred years or so in sports. Are they getting easier to learn? Well, most people I've talked to who teach these things are pretty convinced that they are. But we can't say that this is a morphic resonance effect without somehow teasing out the other factors that influence it, videos, better sports equipment, better training methods, etc. To test for morphic resonance, we need to look at something that's been done repeatedly in the same way, where there are accurate records. In the 1980s, I realized that this is a, a good test for this would be IQ tests, which were developed around 1918 and have been done in much the same way ever since. I predicted that people should be getting better at doing IQ tests. The average score should be going up, not because people are getting smarter, but just because so many people have already done these tests. It turns out that exactly that's been happening. This effect was discovered by a, a psychologist called James Flynn, and it's now called the Flynn effect. The next slide shows the Flynn effect uh, with IQ data from the United States, showing a more than 30% increase in average intelligence during the 20th century. Well, there's no other evidence to suggest Americans are getting smarter, or anyone else for that matter, because similar effects have been found in Britain, Germany, Japan, in fact, all over the world. Um, the tests are just getting easier to do, and um, attempts to explain this um, by psychologists have largely been unsuccessful. Um, it's Flynn himself has come up with incredibly complex um, explanations that involve the whole culture changing, um, virtually untestable explanations. Um, but he confesses himself baffled by this. Well, I think morphic resonance provides a very simple uh, explanation for this. It's just what the theory predicts. And um, it's just one of many possible tests in the realm of human learning and behavior. Well, I think that uh, morphic resonance is going on in all realms of nature, chemistry, physical, biological, um, uh, uh, behavioral. And that um, I think there's quite good evidence for it. I summarize this in the new edition of The New Science of Life, the book that's called uh, Morphic Resonance in the US. What I'm going to do now is talk about some of its implications. First of all, it has major implications for inheritance. It suggests that a lot of the form and behavior the instincts that organisms inherit are inherited not through the genes, which just code for proteins and the control of protein synthesis, but rather through morphic resonance, through morphic fields, through morphogenetic fields and behavioral fields. I've been saying since the 1980s that I think genes are grossly overrated and it turns out that many more people are coming around to that point of view now. The Human Genome Project was a vast technical triumph, but it led to some very surprising and puzzling results for those who believe in the all-powerful gene. Um, first of all, instead of there being 100,000 genes, there are only about 23,000. We don't have many more genes than a fruit fly. Uh, in fact, we have less than the rice plant, which is about 35,000. So genes, uh, th that created a problem. And then when the many genomes were analyzed, it turned out that it was very hard to explain uh, most of inheritance with genes. They only explain five to 10% of inheritance of most characteristics, including proneness to many diseases um, and uh, also simple things like height. The gap between what can be explained with genes and what's inherited is now called the missing heritability problem. It's a major crisis within biology. Uh, and I think this is exactly what you'd expect uh, on the basis of morphic resonance. Morphic resonance depends on similarity and the organisms that would be most affected by it would be identical twins because they're the most similar. 
This hypothesis predicts that if one twin, twin learns something or does something, the other twin, even if separated soon after birth, they should be more likely to do the same thing. I think a lot of the evidence based on identical twins separated soon after birth, showing remarkable similarities, is really evidence for morphic resonance. Right now, it's taken to be evidence for uh, a very strong genetic determinism. It must be in the genes because identical twins separated soon after birth show the same characteristics. I don't think it's evidence for that at all. Uh, I think it uh, can be interpreted quite differently, as I say, in terms of morphic resonance. Perhaps the most radical implication, though, of this similarity of morphic resonance is when we ask the question, who in the past was most like you? If you think about it for a moment, you'll see the organism in the past that was most like you is you. We're all most similar to ourselves in the past, uh, more similar than to any other person or organism. Therefore, the most specific resonance working on us from our past will be self-resonance. And I think this is the basis of memory. The usual assumption, of course, is that memories are stored inside the brain and that um, they are somehow in modified nerve endings or chemicals, phosphorylated proteins, for example. But attempts to find these long-term memory stores have been remarkably unsuccessful, and I think there's a simple reason. They're not there. The brain's more like a TV receiver than a video recorder uh, tuning into these memories. Of course, if you damage the brain, you can get loss of memory. Uh, but that doesn't prove the memories are in the bit you've damaged. If I damage your TV set, uh, I could affect the pictures or the sounds that the set produces, but this wouldn't prove they're all stored uh, or contained within the set. Uh, it just shows those bits of the set are necessary for tuning into them. Now, I think that these fields are relevant to all kinds of healing. Um, the way in which morphogenetic fields underlie the natural development and healing and regeneration of the body uh, is a key to just the maintenance of normal health in animals and in humans long before the advent of medicine. Uh, we're regenerating cells all the time. Our blood, blood cells are breaking down, uh, they're being replaced. Our skin cells are dying and being replaced. Our intestinal lining is being replaced. There's even more regeneration in nervous systems and muscular chairs than people used to think. So I think that this is underlying uh, all these processes of healing. And I think a field model um, for medicine could be a truly integrated model that could enable us to understand how normal uh, healing works through drugs and surgery, conventional uh, medical activities, but also help to understand through looking at the field nature of organisms uh, methods like acupuncture and some forms of um, chiropractic and osteopathy. Uh, and I think this field model provides us with the best way of, of trying to create an integrative medical system, uh, a theoretical basis for it. I think that the memory effects of morphic resonance also help us to understand um, more about the nature of memory itself and um, disorders involving memory. In Alzheimer's, for example, I don't think the loss of memory is because the memories have been destroyed. I think the loss of memory is occurring because uh, the ability to tune into the memories is, is being um, affected by a degeneration of the brain. And these fields also apply to social groups. In, in the next slide, we see, see um, a flock of birds. These are starlings uh, flying over Brighton Pier in England. And the next slide shows some of the movements of these flocks. Um, I think the whole social group has a field and the individuals are responding to that field. That's why they can change direction so fast without bumping into each other. The next slide shows um, a school of fish. Again, the same thing happens with fish. I think human social groups have fields as well. Families, societies, football teams. Um, we're all part of these larger fields of organization, cultures, um, uh, 
that we're these of, and, and I think cultural inheritance depends on morphic resonance. Sometimes people talk in terms of memes, M-E-M-E, -E, Richard Dawkins' phrase, are units of cultural inheritance. It's too granular and atomistic a way of thinking. I think morphic fields give us a more holistic way of understanding cultural inheritance. Also, give us a better way of understanding how uh, inheritance works in family fields. Some of you may be familiar with systemic family constellation therapy. It's a form of working with the field of the family. People are selected to represent the father, the mother, the brothers, the sisters, and so on. And very often it turns out that there's a disturbance in the field of the family that can be traced back to something that happened in a previous generation. The most disturbing things are when a member of the family has been excluded for some reason. Either they exclude themselves by running away or committing suicide or sent away or they, they've been jailed or uh, conditions where they're, as it were, excluded from the um, morphic field of the family. And it often turns out that people in subsequent generations, uh, one member of a subsequent family, a subsequent generation, will as it were, resonate with that excluded person and exclude themselves uh, or behave in ways that are very dysfunctional within the family field. People who do this therapy have found that by reenacting and uh, incorporating the excluded member of the previous generation, uh, the heal, the f there can be a healing that affects the whole field of the family uh, and in a way that individual psychotherapy could not. So that's a form of holistic uh, group healing, family healing, uh, which also, I think, comes under this general uh, category of morphic fields and morphic resonance. I wish I could say more about how a more integrative model of medicine can be constructed. What I've done is give, given a summary of the basic outlines of the principles of morphogenetic fields in particular and morphic fields in general. But I'm not medically trained. My own background is in plant development rather than animal development. I'm, I'm not a practitioner, so I don't presume to say how the details of new medical synthesis can be worked out. I don't see that as my own particular role. But as a biologist, I feel that these insights, that the idea of morphogenetic fields, morphic fields, and morphic resonance can give us, uh, which are all within a more holistic framework, of thinking than the reductionistic mechanistic framework that's still so common within science and medicine. These uh, point to a way forward that can give us a better, more integrated uh, medical system. I think we're going to have to move that way, if only for economic reasons, because conventional mechanistic medicine is simply becoming prohibitively expensive and ever more so as time goes on. We need more effective methods of medicine and healthcare. And we need to find a way of integrating what we've learned from um, conventional medicine through surgery and drugs, great achievements. But also we need to integrate uh, the many contributions made by other forms of therapy. Um, and uh, I think this is a, one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. Join the quantum medicine movement. Speak with an admission advisor today.